Hi, my name's Rob and this is the Weekly English Practice from English Coaching Projects on a cold, wintry evening in the middle of Alaba. Well, the sun is setting. It's about six o'clock in the afternoon, or well, maybe that's the evening, yeah? And it's been a really, really windy day here in Alaba. And I thought I'd come and look for some wind turbines to see them working. And there is one working out there, but only one. And look, it's really windy. So maybe there are safety margins at play here. Maybe it's actually not great for big, enormous machines like those to be whoosh, whoosh, whooshing if there's a lot of wind. What a beautiful evening it is. It's a bit cold though. Anyway, at English Coaching Projects, one of our clients makes components for wind turbines. And so I've interviewed one of the co-founders of the company to ask him about the technical difficulties and technical challenges that these companies face as they produce bigger and bigger wind turbines, especially for offshore wind energy production. As always, you have some questions at the end of the text. Have a look at them, think about them, give your opinion, and send your answers via email, via WhatsApp, or even by paper aeroplane to your ECP coach. Thank you very much for watching, and see you soon. Bye. Monster wind turbines. What are the limits? How big can you make a wind turbine? ECP coach Rob talks to Eugenio Sorazu of Grupo WEC about the technical and financial challenges of making things bigger and bigger. We are all familiar with onshore wind turbines. Those huge white towers with scything blades that cut through the air on breezy days. But these giants are gradually being dwarfed by a new generation of monsters that are helping governments around the world achieve their ambitious clean energy goals. From less than a megawatt just 15 years ago, the latest models under development by General Electric, Siemens, Gamesa and Vestas can produce up to 14 megawatts and power over 15,000 homes each. GE's prototype Halliade X offshore wind turbine rises 260 metres into the sky above Rotterdam Harbour and its 107 metre blades create a total rotor diameter of 220 metres. That's longer than two football pitches. It's a real beast of a machine and getting it off the drawing board and into the sea is proving to be a huge challenge for the companies that manufacture the components. Experts like Eugenio Sorazu of Grupo WEC, an iron casting company based in Itziar in the Basque Country, freely admit that they don't know where the physical limits are for current designs. But Eugenio, a student at ECP, points to logistics and investment as two areas that are already being pushed to their limits. Component suppliers like Grupo WEC are faced with a need to invest in new equipment and in the future any new facilities will have to be located next to the assembly areas, he said. 
the constant increase in the size and weight of the casted components that make up these monsters is complicating the manufacturing process. We are faced with technological challenges, a higher rate of defects and a longer prototyping period, explained Eugenio, co-founder of Grupo WEC and its senior technical consultant. But these are difficulties that can be overcome. It's the transportation of the finished component that is creating the worst headache. Grupo WEC produces hubs, bed frames and shafts for wind turbines at the company's foundry in Aguarain, Alava. The hub is the spherical component at the top of the tower where the blades slot in and at up to 55 tonnes and over 5 metres in diameter these huge iron casts can make you feel very small when standing next to them. But for a 14 megawatt wind turbine they will have to be around 6.5 metres in diameter and weigh up to 80 tonnes requiring foundries to update equipment such as the heavy duty cranes used to lift and move the pieces. It is difficult to get a return on this investment, notes Eugenio, because although the size is bigger, the margin is lower. But the immediate problem, he continued, is that the maximum height for transport along roads, through tunnels and under bridges is five and a half metres. That means current facilities are in danger of producing landlocked components for offshore machines that are assembled at coastal ports. Ramping up offshore wind energy production is essential to accelerating the global energy transition. The cost of offshore electricity generation has fallen by more than 66% since 2012, making it cheaper to build wind farms than new fossil fuel power plants. But component suppliers are struggling to keep up with demand. Governments, private investors and established companies need to develop a common strategy to secure the future of the sector and maintain that drive towards a society powered by clean, renewable energy. And here are this week's questions. Are there any wind or solar farms near your home? Describe them. Does your electricity bill include a green energy component? What other products are getting bigger and bigger? Do you think governments are doing enough to create a society powered by 100% clean energy? Explain. In what ways can renewable energy actually be harmful or contaminating? Thank <laughs> you.